pray that this message hits home today. I want to talk to you out of Genesis chapter 21, verse 14. And I want to give you a little bit of a backdrop before I go into the lesson today. I want to talk to you about Abraham. Everybody say Abraham. And Sarah. Say Sarah. God had given them a promise, right? That he was going to bless them with a great nation. That from their bloodline there would come many descendants. And they were going to be blessed and do what God's called them to do. And that was their promise. And their promise didn't come to pass fast enough. Hello. Have you ever got a promise, but it's not coming to pass fast enough? Because God takes his time with us. Amen. And sometimes we could get a little impatient. And Sarah in this story gets a word from the Lord that her and Abraham are going to have a son. And out of this son will come many, many descendants, as numerous as the stars in the sky. But they can't have a baby. So here they are with a promise, but physically their situation is telling them otherwise. And so they can't have this baby. So after a while goes by, years and years, over 10 years goes by, Sarah decides to conjure up her own plan the same way that you and I do when things aren't working out maybe the way we thought we might have a better idea to come up with it in our own strength our own wisdom our own idea and we think sometimes instead of just waiting for the promise and having faith that it's going to come maybe it won't come on the 10th year maybe the 15th maybe the 20th we try to make our own plans happen in our own strength have I have have you ever been there so Sarah says, okay, I, I can't have babies. I, I haven't been able to have this son and this, this son that God promised us. So maybe Abraham, she said to her husband, maybe you should have a baby with my servant, my slave girl, who was an Egyptian slave girl by the name of Hagar. Everybody say Hagar. I got to break this down for you real quick and then we'll dive into the text. And so Abraham says, okay, let's, let's do it. Maybe that's where the promise is going to come from, through the slave girl, since you can't have kids. So he has a baby with her servant, Hagar. Hagar's obedient. She has the baby. And his name is Ishmael. Everybody say Ishmael. And now we find out later in the story that that really wasn't the promised child. Ishmael wasn't the promised child. And because of their doubt and unbelief and not waiting, now we have an Ishmael on our hands. Now we have a situation. And so we dive into Genesis chapter 21 verse 14 with that backdrop. And when, when Hagar had this baby, it says that Hagar began to treat Sarah with contempt. She started to get a little... She, and, and I cannot have a heart if you're hearing me for Hagar this morning. Because if you look at the situation, she didn't ask to be in this situation. She was just being a servant and being available and willing. And when she has a baby with Abraham, she, her emotions, how many women in this place, when you got pregnant, you had your baby, it was a lot of emotions going on. She started to get emotional and she got very comfortable with Sarah. And Sarah tells Abraham, get her out of here. She's, she's, she's starting to treat me with contempt. And the Bible says this, that she treated Hagar harshly. So the only reason why Hagar's in this situation is because of Sarah. But now the results of Sarah's plan, Sarah doesn't like them. So Sarah says, get out of here. I don't want nothing to do with her. Oh, come on, somebody. That's, that's some rejection there. It says that she dealt with her harshly and Hagar fled into the wilderness with this baby in her womb. Hagar fled into the wilderness, and the Bible says that God met Hagar in that wilderness. And my favorite part about this is that it doesn't say that God heard her when she called. She didn't call on God. Remember, she wasn't as close to God as Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah had visitations from the Lord. But it says that God found her where she was at. God had grace for a slave. God had grace for an Egyptian slave girl. And he met her. He said, Hagar, hey, I have a plan for you. Where are you going? Where have you come from? And then God says, I still have a plan for your baby. Your baby's going to have many descendants as well. And God told Hagar to go back to Sarah. God shows up in the nick of time. And so she goes back. She has the baby. 
The baby grows to be 13 years old, and that's where we dive into verse 14. I know that's a lot to take in, but this is where I want to focus. It says that in the beginning of chapter 21, it says Abram was celebrating his child's being weaned off of his mother, which now we come to the promised child, Isaac. The promise actually came 13 years later. The promise came to pass. Sarah miraculously had a baby. Come on, somebody. God opened her womb, and there is Isaac, the promised child, and his older brother, Ishmael, who's 13 years old now. And it says that Abraham was celebrating an occasion for uh, Isaac, the promised child, and his older brother, just like some of us have in our families, the older brother was mocking him or some versions say that he was laughing at him or maybe he was joking with him. And then Sarah gets upset again when she sees that her son, the promised child, is being made fun of or mocked or laughed at. And Sarah says it again to Abraham, get her out of here. Now, here's the thing. It's been 13 years that Hagar has been there and Ishmael, Abraham's son, has been there living in the family. And now Sarah once again is saying, I'm done with this lady. I'm done with Ishmael. And it says that this displeased Abraham. It hurt him because that was his son who he spent 13 years with memories and times. And it says that it, it hurt Abraham. But God told Abraham, do what your wife is telling you to do. How many know that that's a word from the Lord for some of the husbands in this place? But God had a plan for some reason. God said, let her have her way. Go ahead and let her treat Hagar like that. And that's where we find ourselves in verse 14. It says, so Abraham rose early in the morning. He took bread and a container of water. He's trying to prepare to send his son and Hagar away. And putting it on her shoulder... He gave the water and the boy to Hagar. Now, I want you to just get into his shoes for a second. He has to send his 13-year-old son off with no plan for them. He has to trust God that God is going to meet them where they're at. And all he gives to them is a container of water, some bread, and he says, go on. And he sent her away. Then she departed and wondered. Everybody say wondered. She wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. I want you to hear this part of the story. Beersheba, actually the name of that place was called Well of the Oath. It means Well of Promises. I need you to catch this this morning. That when all of the hell breaks loose in our lives, when we get rejected... When Hagar finds herself in this place that she never even asked to be in and she gets put out into the wilderness, she found herself in a place called the well of promises. Now I got a word for you this morning that in that place you have to start to dive into the well of promises. When, when things didn't go the way that you planned or, or when you feel like disappointed or when you feel like you've been taken advantage of or rejected or isolated or alone, you have to find yourself running to the well of promises. That See, that's where God's promises kick in. When we come to the end of ourselves, God's promises kick in because there's promise for those that are rejected. There's a promise for those that feel isolated. There's a promise for Hagar that feels like she has nothing left to give anymore there's a promise for her in the wilderness you have to catch this this morning some days I feel like I'm living in the promised land in my walk with God and some days I feel like I'm living in the promises in my walk with God do you, do you understand what I'm saying some days you feel like you're at the mountaintop that's the promised land my marriage is good my, my kids are good my finances are good and you're walking in the promised land. But other days, you have to learn to walk in the promises. But you know what? My circumstance is saying one thing, but I know God has a word over my life. God has a promise for me in my marriage. God's got a promise for my children. She ran and she found herself wandering in the well of promises. When the water in the container was gone, and I want all the mamas in this place to just really hear this when the water in the container was gone she she ran out of water in the wilderness no more water for her son 
No more water. You, you want to talk about, I thought about this. You want to talk about the first instant in the Bible of church hurt? Hagar, she must have been church hurt. Because here I am serving this man of God and this woman of God who gets visitations from the Lord. And they done made me pregnant. I done had a baby. And then we realized that I wasn't even supposed to happen. And not only that, they kicked me out into the wilderness. What kind of man of God? You want to talk about some pain and some church? Oh, she would have been on Facebook. What kind of pastor is that? Pastor done put me out the church. She would have been on Instagram, right? Church hurt. See, the Bible, it, it shows our pain. We can, we can relate with those that have gone before us. And it says when the water in the container was gone, she put the child, 13-year-old Ishmael, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down a way off and she said, let me not look on the death of the child. Let me not see him die right here in front of me. Hopeless. No more water. And here she is putting her child under some shade and saying, I don't want to watch him die. But here's the good news. This is the place where God shows up. He, he's not only the God of Abraham and Sarah who have the pretty promises, but he's also the God of Hagar in this moment and Ishmael in this moment who didn't ask to be here, but they're there. He's also the God that meets them. He's also the God that, that steps in and reaches them. That's how much grace God has for us. God sees all of it. He brings it all to balance. And it says that when she said, I don't want to look on the death of the child, she sat there, lifted up her voice, and wept. She didn't weep to God. She didn't cry out to God. She just cried. She didn't know God the way Abraham and Sarah knew him, but God knew her. She, didn't, she wasn't going after God the way that Abraham and Sarah were going after God, but God was going after her. She didn't chase after God, but God was chasing after her. And it says she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. God heard the voice of the boy. It says God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? So when all resources, listen to this, when all resources are, are, are out, when the water's gone, when the bread's gone, when the friends are gone, when Abraham and Sarah put her out, God shows up himself and God says, Hagar, what troubles you? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. My first point to you today is God hears. God hears hears and he not only hears you but he hears your, your your children's children from generation to generation you see I, I i explained it a little bit earlier but 13 years before this when god found her in the wilderness the first time sarah put her out god met hagar in that place as well she called that place the place where god sees me so when god shows up and he says he hears the voice of the boy i can only imagine the joy that Hagar has. She's saying to herself, 13 years ago, you saw me. 13 years later, you hear my boy. That's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Listen, the same God that saved you and reached you is the same God that's going to save and reach your children. The same God that heard your cry and your plea is the same God that years down the line when your children get called by God, he's going to hear them as well. God hears. Psalms 138, I'm, I'm going to start to preach now. Can I preach now? I try to teach a little bit like Pastor Rocio, but I, I got some preaching in me, so I get off track real quick. Psalms 138, verse 6, it says, For though the Lord, and I'm talking about how God hears, for though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. Though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. So he sits high. He reigns above it all. He reigns above every other king. He reigns above every other lord. I'm going to just preach it for a second. He walks on top of your storm. He tramples every demon, every work of darkness. God sits high. He's mighty. But the Bible says in Psalms, he's not only high and mighty, but he looks to the lowly. 
He's not only high and mighty, but he hears the cry of an Egyptian slave girl. He hears the cry of Ishmael. He's able to go into our circumstance and situation, and he's not too big for it. Psalms 116 verse 1 says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. Somebody say he hears. Somebody say he hears. I will call upon him as long as I live because he hears me. Does anybody have a testimony that when nobody heard you, crying when nobody heard you calling when nobody seen you searching there was a god that heard you there was a god that saw you in the middle of your mess your depression your sickness your addiction god saw you and he reached out and touched your life we serve a god who hears see we could come to church and we could say how you doing brother and you could tell me all this stuff i'm Blessed, highly favored, I'm good. And I've done that before, and in my heart, I'm broken. And humans, we'll be like, oh, that's good, brother, God bless. Sometimes we don't hear the cry of our brothers and sisters. But that don't work with God. God is so, he's so faithful, he's so good, that even if you try to put a surface smile, if you try to put a surface cover on your heart, God likes to go a little deeper. Last part about how he hears is 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people, y'all going to like this one. He says, if my people who are called by my name, is that you, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn for them wicked ways, I will hear from heaven I'll forget. He says, if you call on me, I'm going to hear you. If you call on me, I'm going to hear you. If you're going to turn from your wicked ways, I'm going to hear you. He says, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Now, if you study that part, heal their land, you usually talk about healing in our bodies, healing from sickness. But healing their land actually meant, usually it meant this, bringing exiles back to the promised land. Bringing those that the enemy has stripped out of the promised land, taken from home and brought them to another place and and just enslaved them and captured them. Healing their land actually means bringing those people back to their home. Listen, God is bringing some prodigal sons and daughters back home in 2024. God's going to heal our land. I, I know I'm not the only one that's excited about it. He hears. Somebody say he hears. I remember one time I I, I was driving. We were living in Texas and I was driving on the freeway. And my wife, she has a special relationship with God. I promise you, my wife, he hears my wife. I tell my wife, if I if I like really need some, I say, Celeste, you you got to pray. We were driving on the freeway. It was her birthday, August 22nd. It's her birthday. And she's driving on the freeway. She says, man, I would love for my birthday we were going to dinner. She's like, I would love to see some fireworks for my birthday. My wife loves fireworks. Fourth of July is her favorite. And I said, oh, that's too bad. You know, it's August 22nd. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what you want me to do for you. So, you know, and I kid you not, she says that a second later. True story. Fireworks start going off on the side of the freeway. And I'm talking about a full-on fireworks show on August 22nd. Boom, 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 big old fireworks. And my wife's crying. She's like, oh my goodness. God hears me. And it wasn't just like one, we kept driving. I thought we were gonna pass them and we never passed them. They were like going, like I don't know what happened but God was just moving. And then we pull off off the freeway to go to our dinner and we passed this hotel and I kid you not, This hotel, I had never seen it before. We didn't even live in that area. We were in San Antonio just visiting. It was called Celeste Hotel, which is the name of my wife. It was lit up right off the freeway. I I said, I was like, I was about to pass out. I was like, this this can't be real right now. Pray, ask the Lord to give us a, a check. But God hears. Then it says that the voice of the Lord says, said, arise, lift up the boy 
and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So God shows up to Hagar, comforts her with that word that I still got a plan for you. And then it says that he opened her eyes. Now, I don't know if there was a well in that area that she wasn't seeing because she was so blinded by her circumstance. But it said, open your eyes. And it, she's seen all of a sudden her resource. I wrote down right here. He's the God who hears. And then he's the God that fixes your vision. He's the God that fixes your vision. Whatever you do, family, don't let the devil take your vision. Whatever you do, listen, he can, listen, I've been hitting my body and he's taken my health before, but I, don't, I can't let him take my vision. Pastor Eli spoke a couple weeks ago and he said there's a difference between being heartbroken and hope broken. Heartbroken is when you, you feel that pain, you feel rejected, you feel like you're left alone, you feel like you're heartbroken, but hope broken is a whole different thing. Hope broken is when the devil convinces you that it's always going to be that way. Hope broken is when you let the devil take your vision and you can't see past the storm. But I'm telling you this morning, we need to be a people that never let the enemy take our vision. You, you might be walking through hell and high water, but you say, I see right ahead of me. God is going to shift something. I know that God, he did it before. He'll do it again. It's not the end for me. I'm not going to die in the wilderness. God's got a plan for my son. Don't let the devil take your vision. And I'm going to speed up right here. Psalms 27, verse 11. David, he talks about this. Not letting the enemy take your vision, your hope. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me. I, look at this part. Seb, you're going to like this, brother Seb. I would have lost heart. Another version says, I would have fainted. Unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He's saying I got enemies on me. I got haters hating on me. People trying to kill me. There are sicknesses. There's all types of things that are after me. And he says, you know what? At this point, by now, I would have fainted. I would have lost heart if I didn't believe that I would see one day the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So when I read that, what he's basically saying is what's keeping me going, regardless of what I'm in right now, what's keeping me going is I know I'm going to see something at the end of this. And when you study this, many believe that he was not even talking about a physical place, the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Scholars actually believe he was talking about heaven. That he was saying, man, by now with everything I'm going through in, in my life, by now, I would have died. I would have fainted if I didn't believe that one day God had rest for me in heaven. That I was going to reach the promised land. So she went to that well that, she, that God opened her eyes to see. And she filled the container with water. And she gave the boy a drink. A second point is not only God hears, but God fills. In that place, in hopelessness, God fills. He fills your cup. He fills you back with joy when depression has been on you. He fills your marriage back with love and peace when the enemy has been trying to take you out. He fills again. You, you know what I'm, I'm thankful for, Ian? I'm thankful that in the kingdom there's free refills. Come on, somebody. You know you love free refills. Some of you get a water cup at Chipotle and then you go put soda in it. Okay, I'm not going to lie. Can I tell you something? Shadow, you got to edit this part out. I don't want to pay for a soda sometimes because I, get I don't drink too much sugar, so I get majority water, but I, I like a little bit of lemonade. Just to make it like a little bit, like a little bit of lemonade. So I did that one time. 
just confess it to you. The Bible says confess your sins amongst one another. I got a water cup. I filled it up with majority of water. And I was like, ink, just real quick. Ink. And it gave me like lemonade light. You know what I mean? God feels how many times, especially those that have been in this walk for a long time, leaders, how many times have you came to the Lord and you're empty? Your cup is dry. You're like, man, I'm empty. I'm dry. And in that place where you surrender, it's always in the surrender. It's always in the giving up. It's always when you take your hands off of your plans and you come before him and you get on your knees and you go with your spouse or whatever, however you do it, and you say, God, fill us again. Fill us again. And he's faithful. If he could do it for Hagar, somebody who was so forgotten, and if he could do it for Ishmael, and he meets them in the wilderness, then surely he could do it for us as well. And this is my favorite part of the story, and, I, and I'll, I'll finish with this. If we could get the whole team up, the whole team. God hears. Everybody, I want you guys to take this with you. Say, God hears. God feels. God stays. God hears. God feels. God stays. Maybe, maybe these notes will come in handy for you one day. Maybe you're in your seat right now, and it's touching your heart right now because you feel like you're in that place that Hagar was. Maybe that's you right now and you're hearing these words. The last part says, after he drank the water and he filled him, it says, and God was with the boy as he grew up. And God was with the boy as he grew up. He heard him, he filled him, and he stayed with him. He heard him. That's what happened when you got saved. Oh, you better catch that this morning. He heard you at that altar call. He filled you at that altar call. And then he went home with you. He heard me. He filled me. And then he stayed with me. He walked with me. It says that God was with the boy as he grew up. You know, there's not a lot of things, Brother Seb, that you can say God can't do. So before I say this statement, I'm going to be careful. Can't say God can't do a lot of things. But I found one thing that God can't do. He can't be unfaithful to the righteous. I found one thing that he can't do. He can't be unfaithful to the righteous because it's his word. It's his word. And he's not a man that he should. Psalms 34, 15 says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. One thing God can't do if you're walking upright. One thing God can't do if you're walking before him with clean hands and a pure heart. Brother said, one thing God can't do is he can't leave you alone. He can't leave you forsaken. He can't forsake you. The Bible says young, but now I'm older. Never have I seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging for bread. Stand to your feet with me for a moment. God can't leave you if you're walking with him. If you need to be heard, filled, or you need God to stay with you, I want you to come up to this altar with your hands lifted. Heard, filled, or for God to stay with you, come up here with your hands lifted. God, will you hear us? Will you fill us? Will you stay with us? Come on. Bring your brokenness to the Lord. Bring your brokenness to the Lord. How he loves us. Oh.